Hero Metal Show. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. So thank you, thank you, thank you. So we are continuing our series on culture and counterculture. I don't even really know what part we're on now. I think it's going to take us through the rest of the year, I believe. But we are continuing our series on culture and counterculture. Amen. Glory be to God. And so, um, and so, um, so now we're talking about particular issues. We talked for several weeks, later case for standing up for God. That's all that we're talking about when we say uh, that we are counterculturalists, so to speak, which means that we are standing against those elements in culture at large that are anti-God. And there, although that does not involve every single thing about culture, but it, it, there's a lot that is going on in our culture that is contrary to the word of God, amen. And so we talked a lot a lot about standing up, standing up, standing for God, being counted for God. And it may not mean that you're going to convince somebody necessarily. I think that people will. There are people who are strapped in the fence. There are people who just don't know what the truth is. And I think that those people will come aboard. They will come around. Hallelujah. But even in that regard, we are not responsible for converting people per se. We have to present the truth. And the Holy Spirit converts people uh, through the truth that we present. But so 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 it's important and that makes it important for us to present the truth of the gospel, for us to stand up for the word of God. Amen. And so now what we started now is that we are talking about particular things in culture that Christians need to have a voice. Christians need to have a voice about certain things in, in culture. And so that's what we're talking about. Now, and this is what I expect to become controversial because you're going to start talking about issues that people have. People have a specific or a definite uh, opinions about, right? As long as you're talking in general, I mean, every Christian can agree that we need to stand up for God. Every Christian can agree that we need to uh, um, uh, honor God in our dealings and our doings and our stand that we need to represent him. Right? Practically every Christian can agree about that. But then when you start talking about particular areas where that requires a Christian voice, then people get to um um get get um upset and uptight because they have already uh they are already entrenched in, in certain perspectives. And so when you start saying something that is contrary to that perspective, instead of that person going to the Word of God to see if what you are saying are true, they just automatically dig in to what they are believing already. And so I will actually submit to you that all of us, every single one of us can probably stand to revisit some of the perspectives that we have and to make sure that what we believe the way that we see things are consistent with the word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. So we start talking about abortion. I call it baby killing. I call it murder babies. And I know that that's going to offend some people, but I'm not pulling punches. It's important for us to understand what is going on when we are talking about what the world calls abortion. Amen. Um, and so last week, we, we started with the end on abortion, and we looked at uh, the development of 12 weeks development of a baby, uh, 12 weeks of a baby's development in, in utero, in the mother's womb. We went through all that last week. I'm not going to go through it again. If you want to um, um, hear what was said about it, it's on our, our Facebook uh, page what we did last week, but I did want to show, does that zoom, you got that zoomed in, uh -huh. right? So I do want to show uh, at the at the, at the uh, 12 week, I got kind of a model, we talked about this last week, but I didn't have it last week with me. So I got a model of what the baby is looking like. This is, I think this is a life size, life size model of what the baby looks like at the 12 week, right? So it's not that big, right? See, this can fit in the palm of my hand that I got room left over, right? So it's not that big, I want to show it to you, but it looks like a baby. See, you got the arms, you got 
the legs cross like that. You got the head, nose, eyes, mouth, ears even. See the little ears? The little ears, right? And um, and this is uh, uh, 12 weeks. And many people abort a baby after 12 weeks. But this is 12 weeks. So this is what you look, this is what's going on at 12 weeks, right? And um, um, so I don't think very many people, we would do the 12 weeks, you know, week one, week two, week three, week four. I don't think very many abortions are happening during those early weeks because a lot of times ladies don't even know they're pregnant. I think when they're having abortions, I, we believe that life begins with conception. We talked about that last week from scripture. We're going to talk about this week scientifically. So I'm not going to give you a lot of scriptures this week. But, but typically, I believe that this is when people are having abortions. It's one of the reasons why we say that you're killing babies, because this is what you are getting rid of when you are having an abortion. And this is a thinking being, this, at this stage, things are developing, this is a thinking, this, this, this little fella or lady or little girl has emotions, can experience pain, um, the organs are all there, not 100% form, but the organs are all there, uh, uh, so when they, we talked about this last week, when um, when doctors are given abortions, I don't know if this is the case everywhere. I think this is a federal um, requirement, but they they are having to make sure that they are can account for all the parts of that baby that was aborted, right? So they got to uh, make sure that they have two arms. Um, two legs, you know, a head. They got to make sure that they have all of that so that they can, I, I guess one of the reasons they're doing it is make sure they, making sure they got everything. So they are counting for a baby, right? So when you think about that, you cannot convince me that at least a doctor, maybe some mothers don't, but at least a doctor knows that he is murdering a baby. And all of those people that are involved with that procedures, especially the ones that are having to go after those body parts to make sure, they call it something uh, scientific, I guess, but it has a name. But especially all the people that have to go after those body parts, I'm going to try to have the name of that next week when I come back so that we can talk intelligently. But especially all the people, the people who are involved in counting those parts to make sure I got two arms, to make sure I got two legs. How could you not know that that is a person when you are holding up a, a, a little arm in your hand so you can make sure that you got that? When you are holding up a, a leg in your arm and paired it with another leg to make sure you got that, that you can account for that, right? So there's no way that you can convince me that a doctor, that a medical professional does not know that he or she is killing a baby. That is just a glob of tissue. They, 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 when, they, when they are getting rid of these babies, they are formed. They are formed like this. That's why they have to make sure they can account for uh, the body parts. Right. So this, like I said, this week, and I may not be fully wrong, but this week we're going to look at um, science and what science has to say about when does life begin. Now, I'm telling you, I'm not here to convince the world. I think that many people in the world that are advocating for abortion, I think that many of those people know that life begins with uh, at conception because now science is clear on that. Many, many people in the scientific community are saying that life begins at conception. So I think that people don't care about that. I think that the people that push abortion don't care about life, when life begins. They don't care that there is a life, especially when you have some people that are advocating for, for abortion all the way up to the birth of the baby. And one time, I can't remember who, what governor this was, and I think he did come back and retract it, but one time they had a governor stating that even if the baby is born alive, like perhaps the abortion didn't work, or I guess that's what it was. Or maybe the woman decides after the baby is born, she don't want I don't know. But even when the baby, I don't think it was that. I think it was uh, maybe abortion happened and it didn't work or, or something like that. And then so now it says that that should be, it should be between the woman and the doctor when that baby lives. Are y'all kidding me? Are you saying that 
So, 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 so it's only it's just about the woman. It's whatever the woman wants, right? Like if you have a a, a pregnant woman that is carrying a baby, God forbid this should happen. It has happened before. But you got a pregnant woman that carrying a baby. Let's say that the baby, the woman, was killed, and they charged, and then she was pregnant. And of course, because she was pregnant, she may have been carrying a, she, the baby. May have not been the baby. Apparently, was not to the point. Well, not apparently, because it could be that the, the mother was dead for a while before. They got to her, and so the baby may have died in utero because the, it wasn't the by the mother anymore. Uh, but in some cases, maybe the baby was not viable, but the baby died because the mother died, right? And so, in some cases, in some states, it may be every, every state, but the man, uh, the person, that's not the man, the person, because this happened when a woman did it. But the person who killed that mother and that baby could be charged with double homicide, right? So that doesn't make any sense to me if you are saying that there is no life, that there, that, 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 that is just a glob of tissue, that there is no life. So, so that proves to me that it's just about what the mother wants. It's just about what the woman wants. It's not a matter of is there, is it, if, it's, if it's a lie or not, right? So I'm not even trying to convince the uh, the world. Uh, again, there may be some people in the world that are strapped in the fence with this concern, so maybe they can be convinced, but you're hardcore people who don't care. They don't care if this is a lie. They just care about preserving the woman's so-called right to kill her baby if she doesn't want it. Right now, I know that that's a harsh way to present it, but that's the way it is. And so, this is for the church today. For those of you who are in the church, who are still strapped in the fence as to whether this should be a uh, whether, whether this is a life or not, or the life of the fetus versus the choice of the mother, so to speak. Right? I don't think that you should be, I don't, I think that if you are a believer, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are for abortion, for killing babies, because you think that mama has a right to kill the baby, but nobody has the right to kill anybody. Nobody. Right? So, so if you, if you subscribe to the idea uh, that nobody has the right to kill anybody, and then you know from the word of God, and you know from what I'm going to present you scientifically that the Bible, I mean, that life begins at conception, that life begins at conception, then as a believer, you, I don't see any other, I don't see how you can support abortion. I do not see how you can say that the woman has the right to kill a baby as a Christian. And the thing that makes you know that it's a baby, that life begins at conception, is when you see it in the Word of God, but in addition to that, I'm going to bring you scientific information today. And when I show you, as a believer, this is not going to face the world. They don't care. They do not care. Okay? So you cannot base your ideas, your ideology on what the world is peddling, because they don't care about life. They don't care about what God has to say. They don't care about life. But as a believer, can you honestly say that you are for somebody, uh, a doctor uh, extracting this from the mother's womb, this baby from the mother's womb? As a believer, I'm not talking about as somebody who is a non-believer, somebody who's a non-Christian, because I know that for the most part, not, not everybody who's a non-Christian feels this way, but for the most part, they don't care about this. Hardcore abortionists don't care that this is a baby. You can talk to them until you are blue in the face, give them all the evidence you can give them that this is a baby. That's, you, it, that's a losing argument because that doesn't matter to them. What matters is that the woman, so-called right, and it's not a constitutional right as they have tried to make us believe, but that the woman, so-called right to kill a baby, yes, again, I said kill a baby, murder a baby, is intact. Now, as a believer, can you look at this? This is at the 12-week stage. Can you look at this and still support a woman's so-called right to kill this baby? 
Can you do that as a believer? If you can, I have serious questions about your faith. I'm just sorry. I got serious questions about your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I got serious questions about um, your so-called Christianity. Amen. Now, again, I told you we're not wearing kids' gloves today, okay? We're talking up front, and perhaps we're talking offensively. All right, so, and I don't care about offending people who are for killer babies. I'm just going to tell you that up front. Now, technology. Now, back in AD 132, this is just an analogy I want to point out. So back in AD 132, the seismoscope, seismoscope was created or, or yeah, created by a Chinese philosopher, Chang Hing, and it was created to detect earthquake. Now, before that, uh, evidence of an earthquake involved physical sensation. So if you didn't see it, if you didn't hear it, if you didn't feel it, you didn't, you, you didn't, there was, that, there was no evidence of an earthquake. Or if nobody can report having seen this, having gone through this, then there's no evidence of an earthquake before the uh, the invention of the seismoscope. Now, those sensations we all know involves shaking, falling houses, splitting the large pieces of land by separating tectonic plates, you know, stuff like that. I'm sure that's not all of the physical sensations, but those are some prominent ones, right? But through technology, particularly the seismoscope, we now know, we not only know when earthquakes have happened, but we also know that they happen without these physical phenomena. So even when there is no, some earthquakes, earthquakes that result in um, shaking, you know, I didn't know that until I was looking into this, but some, I thought, probably just like many of you thought, that if there was no splitting of the land, if there was no shaking and no falling houses, then there were there was no earthquake, right? But the seismoscope can detect an earthquake has happened even when those physical sensations do not occur. Amen. So then, based on that, it would be foolish of us to assume or to assert that earthquakes only happen when these physical sensations are experienced, right? So it's the same thing with a baby. So now there was a time for thousands of years society recognized pregnancy as living, as a living thing when a woman can feel the baby move inside of her. And I think last week we determined that that, that, did, that happens, uh, I think that may even happen after the 12 week period. Uh, I'm not a mother, so I'm a mother's mother. 12 weeks would be about three months. So you've had a baby. You put the baby within the three months period a little? No. no it was you? Okay. So 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 after the three month period or the 12 week period that we talked about yesterday, at the end of which you have this little thing that's been formed. So you're not even aware. Most ladies, I, I'm, you know, I'm sure you got some super sensitive women that might be aware. But most ladies, for what I understand, are not even aware as far as a feeling. Now, they may be aware because some things have happened in their bodies that let them know, hey, you might be pregnant. But as far as a physical sensation, as far as feeling things, they're not aware that this little fellow or this little princess or prince is on the inside of them, right? If, as far as feeling movement, right? So for thousands of years, that's what determined that there was a Science. life, that the, the pregnancy <laughs> was living, is that when the woman could feel the baby move inside of her, this moment of tangible evidence for life was known as the quickening, right? So without the quickening for thousands of years, there was, uh, there was no evidence of life. Society uh, determined that there was no evidence of life or did not consider that life existed without that quickening. Now, I'm sure even before the ultrasound, I'm thinking that we probably uh, started, you know, there's some physical things, not maybe a movement of the baby, but there's some physical things that um, uh, 
lets the lady know that there's something going on inside of her, like uh, morning sickness, uh, the uh, late, late, uh, uh, missing cycle, you know, that sort of thing. But for years, that's what it was determined. But enter ultrasound technology. So like the seismograph, ultrasound technology revealed that the presence of life, what the seismograph did for earthquakes, the presence of earthquake, um, the ultrasound technology did for the presence of human life uh, in the womb. So like the seismograph, ultrasound technology revealed the presence of life was more than just a collection of physical symptoms. So presence of life through the ultrasound can be determined before the baby ever moves. And for what I understand, before the woman can even know that she is pregnant because, um, uh, because advancement in ultrasound technology uh, makes it so that life in the womb can, is now det detectable eight to 12 days after conception. So eight to 12 days after conception, the woman probably hasn't even missed a period by then. I hate to be drafted like that. But the woman probably hasn't even missed a period by then. Or uh, uh, maybe she doesn't know that she has. Eight to 12 days after conception, and we're gonna talk about what that is today. But eight to 12 days after conception, the, one, the, the, the ultrasound technology can detect life in the womb. Now that doesn't mean that that's when life begins. That means that that's when it could be detected with the technology that we have today. And I'm sure, I won't be surprised, you know, with the technology continue to advance that we won't be able to detect it as soon as it happens. Um, ultrasound technology now comes in 2D, 3D, and 4D. So there's all sorts of things that you can do. And to be frank with you, I think that that's what they use to abort the baby. To, to, to locate the baby, they use ultrasound technology to locate the baby to make sure that they get him or get her, right? We talked about this last week where they got this little instrument that they puncture the baby heads and, then, and, and they look at the technology, ultrasound technology, and when they know that they got that baby's head is when this fluid sorts of flow on the ultrasound screen. So they know they got it. So they even use ultrasound technology to detect a baby to murder, right? And I want you to think about this. This is all based, this is all because we want to preserve, I say not we, I know. Society wants to preserve the so-called right of a woman to kill a baby. They call it pro-choice. They would never say that you were killing a baby even though they know you are, many of them know you are, but they know that's that's not palatable. Society in, at large would not, uh, would, not, would not like that. So that's not palatable. They won't admit, for the most part, that, that you're killing a baby. But you are low, what the doctors use the ultrasound to, to, to do this. So it's interesting and ironic that the ultrasound that can detect a life in the womb is the same ultrasound technology that is used to locate that baby in the womb in order to kill it. So, um, interestingly, notably, the greatest revelations of pre-born life via ultrasound came around the ruling of the famous Supreme Court case, Roe v. Wade, in 1973. Of course, now we know that Roe v. Wade has been overturned. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, I go on record. I'm glad that we don't have that anymore. Now, of course, it doesn't end abortion, but at least it's, um, it's, it's gone. And it allows uh, some states that are pro-life to implement some measures that's going to save babies. So thank God for that. Now, I don't think it's, for me personally, I do not think that it is coincidental that ultrasounds started, uh, uh, you know, revealing life in the womb at the, at the time that Roe v. Wade um, was, was implemented. Because I think that 
the people that were the powers that be at the time. I think that they um, rushed that case because of some of the breakthroughs that was going on with ultrasound technology. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Now, uh, the interesting thing, though, about um, life and abortion and, and preserving life in the womb and all that sort of thing is that we have laws on the book about, I'm, I'm just going to name two, I'm sure it's about, it's probably with every egg being animal, but we have laws in the book, one on, on eagles, bald eagles, that it is against the law to deliberately destroy or hurt eagle eggs. So they don't do it, uh, they ain't going to mess with you if you do it accidentally. But it's against the law to do that. In 1973, at the same time that they were, they were giving women the right to kill babies in utero, they passed a law about sea turtles' eggs, where it is a felony for you, for somebody to del deliberately crush sea turtles' eggs, to destroy sea turtles' eggs, right? Now, why did they do that? Because they acknowledge that there is life in those ears. They acknowledge that. That there is life in, that ear, in those ears, right? And then, and, and I think that it should be against the law for somebody to deliberately destroy ears that has life in it, animal ears that have life in it. I think that should be against the law. Um, but, um, but it should be, also it should be against the law for us to be, for women to be able to kill babies for doctors to be able to kill babies in the in utero, right? Mm -hmm. And now, and to me, that argues, that, that goes against the so-called, and some Christians hold this view too, is that you cannot negotiate morality, and I get that to an extent, but somebody negotiated not killing um, eagles in eggs. Somebody negotiated not killing sea turtles in eggs, right? They're not actual sea turtles yet. They are forming into sea turtles. They are forming the eagles, and there is a law on the books about protecting those in egg, in utero, sea turtles and eagles. And I'm pretty sure, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there was laws on the book about other eggs, other animal eggs being protected. So you can't tell me that we can't legislate behavior. You can't tell me that you cannot legislate right behavior. You cannot legislate moral behavior, right? Now, that doesn't mean that everybody's going to follow the law, okay? But it, but some people will. And, and, and then you got stuff in the books that can protect babies to the degree that people will follow the law. But don't give me that bull about you cannot legislate people not being able to kill babies. And that we shouldn't. Don't give me that. Now, I don't, again, I said this earlier, I, there's no point in arguing with the world about these issues, especially those that are, especially those that are convinced and, and unchangeable in their stance that this is a woman's right. Baby or not, this is a woman's right. Let me give you an example, because when somebody brought up the fact that we protect eagles is and tur sea turtle is, but we won't protect the baby, and then these are the kind of responses you get, where the human race or the human species or the human baby is not an endangered species. Can you imagine somebody having a response about that? That the only reason we should be concerned about protecting human life if it is in danger? And if you're going to have an app, that kind of attitude, why stop that killing babies? Why not kill old folk? Why, why be the outrage about black, and the outrage, excuse me, about black on black crime? Why don't white crime? Why be the uproar about people, when I say crime, I mean murder. Why be the uproar about people killing people, period, if, if the human race is not in danger? See, that's letting you know that the people, for the most part, the people that are pro-abortion have absolutely no respect for life. It has nothing to do with this is a lie. Even though we're going to talk about this today, but I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to the church today. 
trying to get people in the body of Christ to get involved and, 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 and stop allowing our culture to kill babies. Stand up and, and be counted. Let the redeemer of the Lord say so. It doesn't necessarily just mean for you to say that you are redeemed, but stand up for God. Stand up for what God is calling right and what God is calling wrong. Somebody said, yeah, so they, they um, it's illegal for you to crush an eagle head, but that's because you are attacking. It wouldn't be illegal for the eagle or the, or the uh, sea turtle to, um, to destroy those ears. You know, that's a new point because they don't do that. See, the, the, the people, the only people, the only uh, species that do that are, are humans. The only species that kill their young before they are born are humans. So you don't have to make a law against a sea turtle or an eagle destroying their own ears. You don't have to do that because they don't do that. Because they have a lot more humanity, if you would, about things like that than people do. Amen. So just a couple of things Though, I shared those with you to let you know that you are fighting a losing battle when you're trying to get people in the world to be concerned about life. So I'm talking to the church today. So let's look at some scientific things and get some, some, some scientific perspective and then we'll be done. Okay, so uh, many medical professionals, just going to read this one word for word. Well, a lot of these quotes are going to read word for word. Many medical professionals agree that life begins at conception. Moreover, they acknowledge that mother and pre-born child are two patients. So it's not just the body of the mother. There's the body of the mother and there's the body of the baby. Scientifically speaking, they, scientists acknowledge, most scientists and many scientists, many medical professionals, you know, you got those professionals that are probably science, science that won't acknowledge it's just that you got uh, scientists that won't acknowledge that men can't get pregnant. But true science, real science, honest scientists, honest medical professionals agree that life begins at conception and that you got two patients. You got two patients. There's been, there's been a, um, I've, I've read about at least one case where the doctor had to go into the mother's womb to operate on a baby. Um, I mean, that's got to be amazing that somebody could even do that. But to operate on a baby because they had to correct something uh, before the baby was born. Something that was going on that would have caused the baby to die, they didn't correct. And it was pretty... Uh, touch and go, but they were successful, and both the mother and the uh, child lived. But that was a separate, that was a separate body. Now, of course, it involves the mother body. They got to go into the mother's womb. So you can't, you, they're separate bodies, but this body, the baby, is inside the body of the mother. So certainly her body is going to be impacted. Amen, we don't deny that. But we got two separate patients. Each may be treated and diagnosed differently since their medical needs may vary. Dr. Jerome Lejeune, the father of modern genetics, here's what he has to say. To accept the fact that after fertilization has taken place, a new human has come into being after fertilization, has come into being is no longer a matter of taste or opinion. It is plain experimental evidence. Each individual has a very neat beginning at conception. This is a scientist. This is a medical professional. This is not the Bible. But those of you that say you don't believe the Bible, the Bible, so what the Bible? This is a medical professional. Okay, we swear by science in this society, so I'm giving you some scientific evidence. But I know 
that for many people it's not going to matter. I'm hoping that it matters for uh, believers. Keith L. Moore credentials. Let me list his credentials. I don't list the credentials of everybody here. But Keith L. Moore credentials. There is another Keith Moore who is a, 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 a preacher. So uh, This is not that Keith Moore. So Keith L. Moore credentials. He is an anatomy professor at the university. He was these are some of his credentials. An anatomy professor at the University of Toronto, an associate dean for medical science. These are some of the positions that he's had. Chair of anatomy, a founding member of the American Association of Clinical Anatomists. He is uh, an American Medical Writers Association first place award winner uh, for medical books in the physician categories, right? So this is somebody who is steeped in the science, and this is somebody that we in America would trust as a scientist, as somebody who can give us some expert knowledge about science, some expert knowledge about uh, the biological, what biological life is. When does it begin? Here's a quote from his 1988 book. So this is not something that is just coming to be. This is not something in that we realize in the uh, 21st century that we've just come to realize. This is, that's why I'm telling you these people don't care about life because this is information that we've had for up to probably about 40 years or more, right? So, uh, so we started getting breakthroughs um, in about life. When does it begin? Uh, what we can see in the womb with... Um, with our ultrasound technology in 1973. So we had a lot of uh, credible information for a long time. So in 1988, in his book, Keith L. Moore, Essentials of Human Embryology, Embryology, this is what he said, human development begins after the union, the coming together of male and female gametes, gametes or germ cells. So a, a male sperm and a female egg come together doing a process known as fertilization. And this is how he defines fertilization. A sequence of events that begins with the contact of a sperm with a secondary oocyte called an ovum, ovum, O-V-U-M, ovum, or an egg, female egg cell. And it, with, it ends with the fusion of their pronuclei and the mingling of their chromosomes to form a new cell. This fertilized ovum, known as a zygote, is a large diploid cell that is the beginning of a human being, right? So let me put that in labor terms because that's pretty scientific. So basically, an egg, uh, a, a sperm and an egg come together. We all know about that come together, when they come together, that's when fertilization happens. And when fertilization happens, it results in a fertilized egg that of course has to be implanted in the, uh, in the mother's uterus or uh, womb, but it results in a fertilized egg uh, in which, is to be, uh, uh, in which is known, in which is a large diploid. Here's what diploid means, D-I-P-L-O-I-D. Diploid, and it is, it, it is descriptive of a cell or a nucleus. So a diploid cell or nucleus contains two sets of chromosomes, one from the male, one from the female, right? So two sets of chromosomes. So you know the female has XX chromosomes, right? And the male has XY chromosomes, right? And so each of those, each of those parents is going to contribute a, one of their chromosomes, XX, so the female can only contribute an X, right? Because that's all she got, XX, so she can only contribute an X. Because the resulting, resulting um, uh, life is, is, is going to have, can only have, it's going to be diploid, right? So it's not going to be XX, XY. So we're not going to have four chromosomes, can only have two chromosomes. That's what that's characteristic of a human being. Have two chromosomes. 
right? So at the fertilization, the mother gives a chromosome and the father gives a chromosome. The mother can only give an X because she only got X, X. The father can give an X or a Y, right? That's why they say, that's why scientifically, the father is the determiner of the, um, of the uh, gender of the child. Because if he gives an X, we got a girl. If he gives a Y, we got a boy. The woman can only give an X. Now, what I want to point out is that a diploid cell is, is characteristic of a human. So that when that, so that, like when you have a full grown human that is walking the planet, that female has XX, so she got two, you know, two chromosomes. That male has XY, so he has two chromosomes. At the moment of fertilization, that baby, even though there's no arm, there's no leg yet, there's no brain, I don't even think there's a heartbeat, there's nothing that we could detect that we consider to be life. But at the moment of fertilization, that fertilized egg that's going to be um, implanted in the mother's womb has a, has a is diploid, has two chromosomes which is characteristic of human life. So we can see just from that that we got a baby. That we got a baby that we hope is going to be implanted in the mother's womb. So really, before the baby even get implanted, because you know the baby can, something can happen, and the baby can be implanted in the uh, fallopian tube. And of course, we know at that point that that's not sustainable. That if, that, if that stays there, neither the baby nor the mother is going to live. So that, so that has to be dealt with, right? And also, too, that the, the, something could be happening where you may get an egg fertilized. Like this. Some ladies that go through this, I don't know what causes it. I'm not a doctor, but something could happen where even when a fertilized egg, the, u, the uterus is unfriendly to that, so it won't implant, it won't take, it won't take, right? So even though we got a fertilized egg, we have the beginning of the human, we're hoping that we're going to get an implantation, right? And because that's what it's going to take for that baby to grow and develop in that mother's womb. But it is a baby. I suspect that there's going to be uh, beings in heaven that we probably even know about. I mean, you know about your miscarriage if you had one. You know about your... Um, your um, abortion if you have one, but you probably you might not know about the implanted. I mean about the uh, fertilized egg that never got implanted, right? So, so that's when life began according to the scientists. The National Institutes of Health, National Institute of Health, not the Biblical Institute of Health, not the Institute of Biblical. Um, um, ideas. This is the national, which means America, and it's public. It's not private. The National Institute of Health, Institutes of Health. Here's their quote: Fertilization is the process of a union of two gametes, whereby the development of a new individual. So the individuals that I'm looking at right now in this room, you all, your development was initiated at fertilization. Initiated at fertilization. This is what the scientific National Institutes of Health has to say. Um, the, embryo, the, embryo, the embryology textbook, there's a the textbook probably should have several. But this particular textbook on, on embryology, um, um, written by F. Beck, um, I believe the title is Human Embryology, and it is published by Blackwell Scientific Publication again in 1985. So again, this is not new information. It describes how birth is just how birth how birth is just an event in the development of a baby. 
right? So the birth does not itself mean that we have life. It is an event along that development. <clears throat> so when we get to birth, typically, I know that some births are premature, but when we get to birth, typically, it, it means that the baby is far enough developed to be able to come out and thrive and live, still, of course, needing the help, you know, of adults, of parents and doctors and that sort of thing, right? But it's an event. It's an event in the development of the human, of the individual. It is not the determination of whether a baby is a baby or not. So it says here, it's not the beginning of a his or her life. So birth is an event, not the beginning of the baby's life. It should always be remembered that many organs are still not completely developed even after full term in birth. Okay? So even many, let me read this again. It should always be remembered that many organs are still not completely developed by full term and that birth should be regarded only as an incident in the whole developmental process, right? And I guess you can kill that baby along any part of that process, but as you do, it's the killing of a baby. Amen. Clark Edwards and Corliss Patton's Human Embryology, so this is the name of a book as well, published by McGraw-Hill Incorporated. Here's a quote. In the, in the penetration, it is, it is the penetration of the ovum by a sperm in the resultant mingling of nuclear material, talking about the nucleus, nuclear material each brings to union that constitute the initiation of the life of a new individual. Again, when the sperm penetrates the ovum, and result in a mingling of, of the, the nucleus of the two. So now, so we can have a, as we stated earlier, we have a diploid cell, which is the beginning of a human being. The developing human, this is another book. The developing human, so this is not a science book. The developing human, clinically oriented embryology, 5th edition, written by Moore and Passard, and published by the Saunders Company. On the very first page, it says, although it is customary to divide human development into prenatal and postnatal periods, it is important to realize that birth is merely a dramatic event during development resulting in a change of environment, right? So, so, so birth causes a change in environment. So the baby is no longer inside the womb of the mother which ought to be safe, but you know because of abortion is not always safe. But the baby is now in the environment of the world that we're all in. Amen. Amen. So it's a change in environment. Birth is. Birth is not the beginning of life. It is an event along the development cycle that results in a change in environment. Laundering these shelters Shadows, excuse me, not shadows, shadows, S-H-E-T-T-L-E-S, Landra, B, shadows, a scientist who wrote Rights of Life, the Scientific Evidence for Life Before Birth. Uh, this was published by Zondervan. This was written in 1983. The zygote, I keep telling you the, the years that these was written and presented so that you can know that this is not new information, this is information we've had all along. And yet we sustain Roe v. Wade knowing this information for all those years. And then when it, it gets overturned, uh, even Christians get upset. I mean, it is ridiculous. This, so this is what uh, he says. The zygote is human life. There is one fact that no one can deny. Human beings, even though they do deny it, human beings begin at conception. Zygote is a term for newly conceived life after the sperm and the egg cell meet, but before the embryo begins to divide. 
So right before, you know, you start the plotting and, and you know, things start, start happening. It's a zygote, right? But it's human life. It's the initiation of human life. Okay, so here's Keith Elmore again. He, in, in another book that he wrote, this was in 1998, he says that the zygote and early embryo are living human organisms. So even the zygote before uh, cell division is, is considered scientifically to be a living human organism. Amen. Amen. Just a few more quotes, then we're gonna call it quits for the day. Sally V. O., so here's a woman, in case you guys think this is all about, you know, um, privileged white men, saying things about science that may or may, or may not be true. You know how we think these days. <laughs> if it doesn't come from a woman, it's not necessarily, it's not, it's not believable. But here's a lady, a lady scientist, Sally B. O's. Obstetric nursing is the name of her book. Uh, she wrote it with, in collaboration with others. But obstetric nursing is the name of her book. It was published um, by Addison Wesley Publishing. Look at this, in 1980. So this is 42 years that this information has been out there scientifically. She says, thus a new cell is formed from the union of a male and a female gamete. And uh, you know, parentheses it says sperm and egg cell, right? So the gamete is a sperm and egg cell. So female gamete is an egg cell, the male gamete is a sperm cell. The cell referred to as a zygote, so that's when they come together, again before the vision, cell division. The cell referred to as a zygote contains a new combination of genetic material. Again, when we, we talked earlier about, lot, we talked about the earthquakes, right? When an earthquake is not an earthquake just because you see evidence of it, right? And here again we see life is not life just because we see evidence of it. There's things that happen before you can see it that is involved in getting that life uh, completely formed. And in this particular case, we got DNA that is going on. And we all know DNA. DNA is the reason why you act the way you do. DNA is the reason why you look like your family. DNA is the reason why uh, you may be predisposed to certain medical conditions. Positions, excuse me. Conditions, excuse me. DNA. Right? And that DNA is happening at the very beginning. The zygote contains a new combination. See, it's got, it's, it, 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 that's why, uh, it's, 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 I guess that's why they got to give it another name. It can't be gamete anymore because you got gamete, is female gamete and male gamete, so unique to the, uh, to the genders. But now it's a zygote and it's a combination of genetic material. So it's put a genetic material from the mother and it's put a genetic material from the, from the father to make you uniquely you, even though you may have siblings that come from the same mother and the same father, but at those times that it pulled, it pulled, it made a unique human being. You may have similarities to your brothers and sisters and you certainly got similarities to your parents, but you are unique. There are things about you that's not um, a part of your parent because you are a combination of them to make something unique and different. Amen. So here it is. Let me read this part again. So it contains a new combination of genetic material resulting in an individual different from either parent. I said that without even reading this before. An individual that's different from either parent and from anyone else in the world, right? And we know that. I mean, how many parents have looked at your children and said, I don't know where they got that from? And even both of the parents say that. I don't know where they got that from. I say that about my children now. I don't know why that boy does that. I don't know why that girl act like that. Because that, that that's not something I gave her. And, and the, and the, and the uh, mother said, ain't something I gave her either. But you did together. You brought together your genetic material, his, her genetic material came together and made a unique individual from the beginning of fertilization. 
This is a lie. Scientifically, this is a lie from the very beginning. James Bob, Human Life and Health Care Ethics, published in 1985 by the uh, University Publications. Every human being alive today, and as far as is known scientifically, every human being that ever existed began his or her unique existence in this manner. That is as one cell. As one cell. So even if you had an abortion at one, two, three weeks before you even knew there was a baby, you know, you probably wouldn't have an abortion, but you know, they got the uh, morning after pill. And I have to do some research on that. I don't know exactly what that is, to tell you the honest truth. I can't speak on that today. But, um, but even one, two, three weeks, once that baby is, is, is uh, once that, that uh, cell is fertilized and, and plants in the mother's womb, if you go and you have an abortion, you are killing human life. You are disposing of human life. As one cell, if this first cell, or instantly this, if this first cell or uh, any subsequent, subsequent configuration of cells, you know, that comes from that one cell, perishes, the individual dies. Before they are even born, the individual dies, ceasing to exist in a matter as a living being. There are no known exceptions to this rule. Listen, in the field of human biology, and the human biology is science, the last time I checked. Again, I want to read that. There are no known exceptions to this rule in the field of human biology. Dr. Micheline Matthews Roth, another lady. Dr. Micheline Matthews Roth, Harvard Medical School. So we would think that she is quite credential and quite trustworthy as a scientist. Quoted by Public Affairs Council said, it is scientifically correct to say that human life begins at conception. It is scientifically correct to say that human life begins at conception. It is scientifically correct to say that human life begins at conception. Dr. Micheline Matthews Roth. She said that in a video for produced by National Geographic, and the video was entitled The Biology of Prenatal Development. No, 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 no. That's not her. That's not her. What I said, the quote is belongs to Dr. Matt, uh, Micheline Matthews Roth. But this right here, the biology of prenatal development video produced by National Geographic in 2006, this is what came out of that video. That video had a quote, biologically speaking, human development begins at fertilization. Biologically speaking, biology is a science. Scientifically speaking, you could say, human development begins at fertilization. Amen. And our last quote, scientific quote of the day, comes from Scar Rain, Rain, Wayne, Weinberg, Weinberg, Scar Weinberg and Levine. The book title, written in 1986, titled Understanding Development, and it was published by Harcourt uh, Grace Javonovich, which is one of the companies that is famous for publishing many of our science books. So it has a long track worker, this company. Amen. Here's the quote. The development of a new human being begins when a male's sperm pierces the cell membrane of a female ovum or egg. The villi become the placenta, which would nerve the villi. It's like the, uh, I think the hairs or something. But it's a part of the, uh, the, the, um, 
is a part of the uh, the uh, PBLE. The bill, I believe, the bill has become the placenta which would nourish the developing, the developing, the developing infant for the next eight and a half months. Amen. So here you have it from science. Amen. That baby life begins at conception, right? And so are you going to, as a believer, are you going to defy the Bible? I would think that would be enough for you. But are you going to defy the Bible? And are you going to defy science? Both of them in agreement, the Bible and science. Are you going to defy those, what they say about life beginning at conception? When the egg is fertilized, it is life. Even before it implants itself in the mother's womb, it is life. So as a Christian, I implore you to stand for the life. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. All right. Thank you so much. So we're going to do our communion right now. As you know, we have been commissioned by God to do communion when we gather together on Sundays, and we have not been released from that yet. Amen. So let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and praise you for the opportunity to take it me today. Hallelujah, in Jesus' name. And it is just such a pleasure, pleasure excuse me, Father, and a privilege to be able to do so. Lord God, in the name of Jesus, glory be to God. And so, uh, as we take communion, we remember. We remember who Jesus is. We remember what he has done, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. It's hard to remember every single thing, because I don't even think we know the repercussions, uh, maybe the repercussions is not a good word because it's not negative, but we don't know the encompassing of, uh, impact, good, positive impact of what Jesus has done. Hallelujah. We might not even know until we get to heaven. But anyway, we do know some of what he has done to be so glorious, and that's what we remember. In gratitude, so grateful, Father God, and in expectation, meaning that we are expecting we are expecting what Jesus has done on our behalf to be manifested in our lives. We give you the praise and the glory and the honor for that, Father God. As we do this, Lord God, add your power to what we are doing. Make it effective, Father God. Hallelujah. Embed it in us, Father God. Sear it in our conscience, Lord God, so that we may never forget. Hallelujah. That we owe our very lives our souls to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for that, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. From 1 Corinthians 11, beginning with verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do and remember to me. After the same manner also, he took the cup, when he had stopped saying, The cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death be come. Amen. All right. Thank you so very much for joining us today. God bless you. Have an awesome God day. A day where God is in control and God gets to call the shot. Amen.